Okay, uh, where we left off last week was with the auditory pathway, and here we have it on the slide once again, and so I can talk a little bit in more detail. We were running out of time in last week's lecture. Um, the story starts in the cochlea, which is represented here by this. Cochlea is Latin here, uh, Latin for snail. And in the cochlea, this represents a cross-section of the cochlea, and you have these little hair cells. And the sound waves actually bounce this thing, this membrane up and down, little hair cells. The hairs on the hair cells get bent, and that makes action potentials. So these axons come in from the cochlea, and as they come in from the cochlea, they form a nerve. And what nerve would that be? Vestibular cochlea, or what number? Eight. Okay, so it's part of the eighth cranial nerve. And the first synapse is going to be either in the ventral cochlear nucleus, or a few of them go up to the dorsal cochlear, cochlear nucleus. And again, if you have damage in the, to the cochlea, or the nerve, or this first nucleus, then the hearing loss is going to be ipsilateral, all right, to the damage, all right? Can we focus on the slides rather than me? Thank you. Uh, okay, so damage is going to be ipsilateral uh, if it's damage to the cochlea or to these, this first synapse. After that, you're going to see this path is, is highly crossed and uncrossed. So it's crossed and uncrossed. After that, if you get damage, you'll see uh, loss in both ears. So the dorsal or ventral cochlear nucleus, um, they are either going to send axons that go across the midline, and if they send axons that go, the, vent, the ventral cochlear nucleus, if it sends axons that go across the midline, uh, it will form something that you already have seen in lab, and that is the trapezoid body. You saw that in lab, right? What subdivision of the brain is the trapezoid body in? You got to yell at me. I got a truck and hearing loss to boot. Not meds. Nope. All right. We'll make this multiple choice. My, met, mes, di, or tail encephalon. Met. All right. Okay. So this bump is in this trapezoid body, which we'll look at in just a moment, is in the metencephalon, and the, the first synapse after this dorsal or ventral cochlear nucleus in this pathway is in something that's called the superior olive or superior olivary complex. So the superior olive or superior olivary complex is actually something that we know a little bit about what these neurons are doing, uh, both from comparative work and lesion work and electrophysiology. So uh, the comparative work, if an animal has a big superior olive like a kitty cat, these animals are great at localizing sounds in space. All right? If an animal like a pigeon, which has a really scrawny, wimpy one, they have a heck of a time. You give them a task trying to localize sounds in space, they have trouble learning it. Now, Jared will tell you that a pigeon has trouble learning anything. But if it's a visual discrimination, they can pick it up within a day. They're, they're pretty smart about those things. Hearing. Uh, localizing in space, no. If, in kitty cats, if you, who are really good at this kind of task, you put them in a, what you do is you put them in a dark arena and you'll snap something over here or you have two things and they have to go to the one that goes first. They're great at figuring out where to go and get some food. If you lesion it though, they can't do that anymore. And similarly, uh, electrophysiology suggests that uh, the superior olive neurons are coding for things that have to do with localization of sounds in space. So uh, they're really good at temporal differences. So if you have two clicks that go one here, one there, uh, you have neurons in your superior olive that will code for which one came first. Or they're also even good at picking up phase differences. So actually the phase of the sound wave as it hits one ear will be slightly different than the one that hits the other ear if it's coming from this direction or that direction. 
And those neurons can code for that kind of stuff, too. So we're pretty sure that the superior olive is involved in sound localization. All right. Cell bodies of the superior olive send their axons rostral, which means what? Toward the nose. So they're going to send their axons in a bundle going up rostral. And like I've said many times, everything gets a name in anatomy. And the name of this bundle is the lateral lemniscus. Lateral lemniscus. You got two, you got lemnisci. And this a lemniscus is a ribbon. It's a ribbon of axons going up. And what we're showing you here are exploded sections through the brainstem. So this is down here. Here are the, here are the pyramids. So we're down here just in the, the caudal metencephalon. Here, this ribbon is going up. And here, you can see on the ventral side here, the cerebral peduncles. So, and this even tells you it's midbrain. And the Greek for midbrain is what? Mesencephalon, right? Mid, like, do you, anybody ever play piano or something like that? You have mezzo forte, mez, mez, it's the same prefix, middle. Okay, so the, the next synapse in this system is going to be in the mesencephalon in the good old inferior colliculus, which you all saw in lab, right? Okay, so the inferior colliculus in the mesencephalon. So every... All of the auditory stuff is going to end up synapsing in one side or the other of the inferior colliculus. The cell bodies of the inferior colliculus then are going to send their axons up to the thalamus and more specifically the medial geniculate body or nucleus. The so medial geniculate body or nucleus. If it's in the thalamus, what subdivision? Diencephalon, right. Okay, so medial geniculate body or nucleus is part of the thalamus, which is also represented here by this gray ball. And then the cell bodies of the medial geniculate nucleus are going to send their axons up to the temporal lobe. And what the artist is showing you here is most of the auditory coding is going on and the cortex that's down inside that lateral or sylvian fissure, all right? So there's cortex lining that sylvian fissure. So on the ventral side, that's where the auditory cortex is. And what the artist is showing us here in this picture is what this artist was able to do, but I was not because I would break my brain, uh, is they've grabbed the temporal lobe and yanked it out to show you uh, this auditory cortex on the dorsal side of the ventral lobe. Okay? Excuse me. Did I, what did I say? Dorsal side of the temporal lobe. There is no ventral lobe. Okay, dorsal side of the temporal lobe. So, and what the artist is also showing you is that there is a tone map that is preserved in this system. So, back in the good old cochlea, uh, the hair cells that are actually in the, the first part of the cochlea uh, code, what this shows is that they're coding for high pitches, okay? And that's what's completely beat up and dead in me because too much rock and roll. So I can't hear high pitches anymore. So uh, the low pitches, the car stereo pitch, pitches are coded in the very apex of the cochlea. And this division of tones is carried throughout this whole system. And when you get up to the cortex, the high pitches are actually way inside on this, and the low pitches are coded out towards the lateral surface. Okay, so what we can see, let's go now over this system, what we've seen in lab and what we will perhaps see later. So what view of the brain, sheep brain, we got here? Ventral. Okay, so here is the trapezoid body once again. And once again, what subdivision of the brain is it in? Metencephalon. Okay, if I stuck a pin in it and I said these axons are probably coming from where, what would you tell me? All right, so ventral cochlear nucleus would be a good answer. All right, so most of them are coming out of there. Okay, uh, could be superior olive too. All right, both answers would be acceptable. All right, so trapezoid body. So that's one place here. Uh, we see 
uh, superior and inferior colliculus. So uh, what subdivision of the brain are we in here? Mesencephalon. And say I stick a pin in the inferior colliculus. And I could ask a question like, besides what subdivision, um, gets projections from where? What would you tell me? Lateral lemniscus is the axons. The question, that's actually a good, I'm glad you made that mistake. All right, so lateral lemniscus is the axons. The question is asking, where are the cell bodies that send the axons that terminate here? Superior olive, okay. If I stick a pin in the inferior colliculus and I say projects to where, what would you tell me? Medial geniculate, good. All right. What kind of section is this? Coronal. All right. And here we're fairly far back, fairly caudal in the telencephalon. This is telencephalon and this is brain stem. And here we can see the medial geniculate nucleus. Now, truth be told, it's hard as heck to make a coronal and hit this. You've got to be just spot on. So we may not see the medial geniculate in a coronal section but we probably will be able to see it when we do the horizontal sections next week. All right, so you will get a view of it. I'm not sure we'll be able to see it in the coronal section. Usually you, you got to get just have an incredibly lucky day to do that. All right, but if I could stick a pin in it and say, all right, uh, this medial geniculate nucleus gets projections from where? Inferior colliculus, and it's going to project to where? temporal lobe auditory cortex, A1, or let's look at Brodmann's scheme. Okay, so here's Brodmann's scheme with which you're now a little bit familiar. And what we can see here, this is the lateral surface. And as I mentioned, most of the auditory coding goes on down inside this fissure, this lateral or sylvian fissure. There's a little tiny bit of it, area 41, uh, Brodmann's area 41, uh, where the auditory cortex can be found. So I, one of my favorite questions is to drop a pin in there and say, gets projections from where? And you tell me what? Medial geniculate nucleus. Okay. All right. Let's go on then and talk about the somatosensory systems. We got two. Before I jump into them, I want to talk a little bit about the organization of spinal cords. And spinal cords are always presented so that ventral is down and dorsal is up, okay? And you'll notice here, this probably is something you've already been introduced to, that the spinal nerves have two roots. There is a, a dorsal root and a ventral root, okay? You already knew this, yes? Okay. And actually, they don't split into two roots until... Uh, the nerve gets into the spinal column, so it's got to get inside the bone before they do this split. So it's act they're actually not very big. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit something of law, and this is the bell Magendi law. Okay, the bell Magendi law, which I think I have here in my next slide. bell Magendi law, the dorsal root is somatosensory. Ventral root is somatomotor. Okay? So let's talk about how the bell Magendi law came to be. So first of all, there was this guy, this English guy named Bell, and he noticed that there was a dorsal root and a ventral root. It's like, why the heck are there two roots? So he decides to do an experiment. So he, he gets some kitty cats, and when he cuts the ventral root, uh, this was done way back in the 1800s, what he notices when you actually cut a nerve, you set off action potentials. And so... He cuts the ventral root, and the kitty cat goes, all right? So, and when he cuts the dorsal root, kitty cat doesn't do anything. So Bell says, ah, okay, I got it. The ventral root, it's motor. Dorsal root, somatosensory. A few years later, there's this guy by the name of Magendi. And he comes along, and he looks at it and says, I wonder why the heck there are two roots. He's never read Bell's paper. All right, so he does an experiment in which he cuts the ventral root on some kitty cats, and other kitty cats he cuts the dorsal root. If he cuts the dorsal root, 
The kitty cats can walk around just fine, but when he pinches their toes, they don't howl. Okay? And if he cuts the ventral root, they're par paralyzed, but when he pinches their toes, they howl. Okay? So Magendi says, okay, I got it. Ventral root is motor, dorsal root is somatosensory. Bell's students were outraged. They said, our professor did it first, and our professor deserves priority. This Magendi guy is just trying to usurp our professor's finding. So they send Magendi Bell's paper, and Magendi says, well, I actually didn't know about this paper, and I did a much better experiment than Bell's, and so I'm not giving up my claim to this result. Bell's students just had this kind of propaganda war. They said, Look at the nasty things that this Magendi guy is doing to kitty cats. Never mind, their professor Bell did the same experiments on kitty cats. So on it went, and on and went, and on and went. And so finally the compromise was to call it the Bell-Magendi law. So they both get credit. By the way, um, they, I think, later became really good friends because I ran across a paper where they had worked together and they were trying to figure out what the trigeminal nerve did. And so they decided to sever the trigeminal nerve in an ass, by which I think they meant a donkey. And so what they did, when they cut the trigeminal nerve in the ass, its jaw drops open. Why? It's muscles of it innervates muscles of chewing. So when they paralyze it by cutting it, the jaw drops open. Okay, so this long-winded story is to get to this point. And that is that the stuff up in the dorsal part of the spinal cord has to do with somatosensory things, and the ventral horns and the ventral part of the spinal cord has to do with motor. All right, so now we're going to turn our attention to the two somatosensory systems. We'll take them one at a time. First, we're going to talk about the dorsal column system. And before I go on, let's talk about the sensations that are unique to this dorsal column system. So, as I mentioned, there are two systems, and a lot of sensations are shared between them. All right? they, they both serve touch, for example. But there are some sensations that are specific to one or the other of these systems. And sensations that are specific to this dorsal column system is, first of all, epicritic touch. That's well localized touch and pain. And this is the kind of pain that you will probably never ever see somebody in a clinic for because this is there and gone. I'll explain why in a little bit. Another sensation that is specific to this system is kinesthesis or proprioception. We talked about this in lab. What do we mean by kinesthesis and proprioception? So proprioception is what? where your body is in space, and kinesthesis is how's it, how it's moving. Also specific to this system is two-point tactile. Anybody ever have to do these two-point tactile experiments? How close they can get before it feels one versus two? Okay, so the one versus two discriminations are handled by this system. Okay? And then lastly, what I call touch across time. Okay, so one of the standard clinical tests of this system is much like a game that we used to play when we were kids. So uh, if you trade, you would say to somebody, you trace a letter B on their back, and you say, what is that? Okay, and they say a B, and then you slap them and say, got it, right? All right, so somebody who's damaged this system can't tell you what letter you're tracing on their back. They can't integrate touch across time. Okay. Ready for the anatomy? All right, so this system, uh, the axons coming in from the periphery. Let me take a little sidebar here. The neuroanatomists are chauvinistic. We have central nervous system, brain, and spinal cord. Everything else is periphery. All right? Axons coming in from the periphery are large, highly myelinated axons. So they're going to be relatively fast, relatively slow. Fast, okay? These are some of the weirdest neurons in the whole body. These are what, what are called unipolar. Their cell bodies actually hang off the axon, okay? And 
so these are in what's called the dorsal root ganglion. That's where the cell bodies are. And the, ax the action potentials actually start way the heck out in the periphery where the stimulus is. And they come zipping up. They go right over the cell body and just keep on going in. When this nerve root gets into the spinal cord, uh, it goes into this dorsal column here. All right, so what's called the dorsal column. So this is the white matter on the dorsal side. It doesn't synapse. It just does a 90-degree turn and goes up rostral. Okay? If the axons are coming from the lower part of the body, they go up in something called the fasciculus gracilis. Can you read these labels from way back there? Yeah? Wow, good eyesight. All right, so fasciculus gracilis, if they're from the lower part of the body, if they're from the upper part of the body, they go up in a different column right next to it called fasciculus cuneatus. All right? They stay ipsilateral initially, which means what? Same size. They're going to stay ipsilateral. Okay? They don't synapse until they get to the lower medulla. Medulla would be a synonym for what? What subdivision? Myelencephalon. So they don't synapse until we get to the lower medulla. If the axons came up in the fasciculus cuneatus, they'll synapse in the cuneate nucleus. If they came up in the fasciculus gracilis, they'll synapse in the gracile nucleus. Okay? Now, this week you all told me that this pathway crosses, right? Yes, you did. All right, come on. All right, so here's where it crosses. These cell bodies of the cuneate nucleus or the gracile nucleus, they send their axons across the midline. So that's where the pathway crosses. All right? And when they initially do this, it's said to be diffuse, because all the axons are kind of going every axon for itself. All right? And then when they get across the, the midline, then they, they make a 90-degree turn, go up rostral, and make a tight bundle. Again, everything gets a name. So this tight bundle is called the medial lemniscus, medial ribbon. All right, so this goes all the way up. This is, again, showing exploded sections through the brain stem. It's going to go all the way up, 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 up to the thalamus. And in the thalamus, it's going to finally synapse in the ventral, posterior, lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Ventral, posterior, lateral nucleus of the thalamus, the VPL. If it's thalamus, it's what subdivision? Diencephalon. Okay? These cell bodies of the VPL are going to send their axons up to the cortex, and as they are leaving the thalamus, they will form part of what's known as the internal capsule, which we'll be seeing a lot of next week, uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule, all right? And then there's, so these axons will finally synapse in the cortex. And indeed, uh, where in the cortex will these synapse? We talked about this. Say it loud. I heard it. Post-central gyrus. What lobe is that? Parietal. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about this pathway. Um, again, this, I put this slide in here to emphasize that you have axons. If they're coming from the lower part of the body, uh, they go up in this fasciculus gracilis. If they're coming from the upper part of the body, they go up in this fasciculus cuneatus. So here's a thought question. This section of spinal cord, uh, where is it from? The lower part of the spinal cord or upper part of the spinal cord, and why? Say it. Why did you pick upper? You see the cuneatus. If it was from the lower part, this part wouldn't be here at all, right? 
because those axons wouldn't even be there. All right, good. Okay, and I put this slide in to show you that the uh, relative amounts of white and gray matter change as we go down the spinal cord. So this one, this is going rostral to caudal, as one would read in English. And uh, so you can see this is from the cervical region, and then the thoracic, thoracic, lumbar, lumbar, and then sacral. And so uh, what you can see here is up in the cervical region, we've got both the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus. There's actually a little bump that divides them. But as we go down into the sacral and lumbar regions, we only have which one? Gracilis. Okay. Also, so as you go, the other way to think about it, as you go further rostral, you're going to be adding axons that are coming in, some somatosensory axons. And as you're going further <coughs> caudal, the motor axons are going to go in and synapse in the ventral horn primarily, and they'll be dropping out. Okay, so you're losing motor axons as you're going down, and you're gaining somatosensory axons. Does that make sense? Losing descending motor axons, that is to say. All right. What I got here is a cross-section of a rat's spinal cord. And again, uh, dorsal is up, ventral is down. And this was a stain that stains uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so it stains the cell body. So all of these dots are cell bodies of neurons. And the dendrites and the axons don't show up in this kind of a stain. But these little teensy dots are all around here. These little teensy dots are the endoplasmic reticulum in glial cells. Right? But here, all of this that stains this kind of purple-blue, this is all gray matter, so this is primarily cell bodies. And these great big neurons down here in the ventral horn, these are motor neurons. Okay? So where do motor neurons send their axons? Motor neurons in the spinal cord, where are they going to send their axons? Say it loud. Muscles. All right, they send their axons out to the muscles and innervate the muscles. All right. So I know for sure, like, these are motor neurons, those are motor neurons, that's a motor neuron. Some of these others might be also. Okay, uh, and all this stuff in here is white matter, all right? That means to, so when I say white matter, what am I talking? Myelinated axons. All right, so I'm going to tell you, say I put this on an exam, and I'll stick a pin right or some labels right there and say, uh, this is from the lower part of the spinal cord. What is that? Say it loud. Fasciculus gracilis. All right, very good. Okay. Um, now, uh, I talked about the fact that um, these axons carry proprioceptive and kinesthetic information, right? And so here's a disease that actually attacks and kills these neurons in this dorsal column. This disease, uh, it's when, when, this, when these neurons, when these axons, I should say, when these axons are destroyed, the disease is called Tabes dorsalis. Anybody know what causes this stuff? Okay, let me tell you the story of my buddy from school. And one of my buddies was a sailor during the Vietnam War. And when he was in port, he managed to hang out with not the nicest ladies in town, let's say. All right, so he ends up with a whopping case of syphilis. All right. And it's the syphilis that will kill off these axons and cause this tabes dorsalis. All right. So, my buddy, what do you think? Uh, could he feel where his body was in space? No, he couldn't. But he could still walk around. And if we were, gonna ha if we were going to a lecture that w where it was a darkened hall and the professor was going to show slides and they shut off the lights and he was still walking... He is down on the floor, kissing the floor. 
because he couldn't feel where his body is in space. He, he had to see where his feet were going to go to get around. All right? If he couldn't see where his feet were going, he would end up. And that's because these axons uh, code for proprioception, so he couldn't feel where his body was in space. It actually is a damn shame because syphilis is curable with antibiotics, so he should have never let it get to that point. Okay, um, here in this slide, this is another coronal section. This is about midway through the telencephalon, and here is the thalamus, this gray ball right here. The thalamus, of course, is not part of the telencephalon. It's part of the what? Diencephalon. And this is the internal capsule, these axons that are wrapping around the thalamus on both sides. Okay. So, again, the last thing, the last synapse in this system is up in the cortex, and it's up in the post-central gyrus. Post-central gyrus, which again is in which lobe? Parietal. Okay, so there it is, this in blue here, this somatosensory strip, post-central gyrus. And there is a representation of your body on that post-central gyrus. It's known as a somatosensory somatosensory homunculus, or sensory homunculus. Homunculus means what? A little man or a dwarf. And this is a disarticulated representation. So, for example, the legs are up kind of right there, and then the arm and face is over here. So it's, it's chopped up. It's not head to toe like you are. It's not completely head to toe like you are. And the amount of the cortex that's devoted to various things is in proportion to how sensitive uh, various parts of your body are. So there's like a huge representation for fingertips and lips that are very sensitive. And things like your back, uh, if you ever do those two-point tactile, you can actually get inches apart on a back before people will say two instead of one. Not very sensitive, despite all the back pain that people complain about. The skin. Maybe the muscles are sensitive, but the skin is not. Okay. Now, let's talk about the other system. This is going to be the spinothalamic and spinal reticular system. And this system, again, codes for things that they have in common, like touch and stuff like that. But what is specific to this system is something that's called protopathic pain, protopathic pain. Protopathic pain is the kind of pain that you're going to see someone come into a clinic for. All right, this is the stuff that hurts and hurts and hurts and keeps on hurting, and this is what people don't like. Uh, so this system is going to code for protopathic pain. I write here except face, which is going through the trigeminal and is really complicated, and I'm not going to cover it in this class. Okay? So this is just the body, not the face. And the other thing that is unique to this system is temperature, okay? And in, in some places, this system is convergent with the dorsal column system, and in other places, uh, it parts company. So the axons come in from the periphery, and these tend to be small, poorly myelinated axons. So they're going to be relatively fast, relatively slow. Slow, okay? Again, their cell bodies are out in this dorsal root ganglion. And these are going to come in, and they're going to synapse right away when they get to the spinal cord. Okay, so as soon as they get in the spinal cord, they synapse. And they're going to synapse in something called the substantia gelatinosa. Substantia gelatinosa. Substantia gelatinosa, I'll show it to you in a minute. Substantia gelatinosa uh, is a special part of the spinal cord. It's up there on the dorsal horns, and it plays a special role in that it's a pain gate. There are lots of opiate receptors in that substantia gelatinosa. And 
early on when they were finally discovering, have you guys heard of endorphins and enkephalins? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, when they were discovering those, that's one of the places where they said, oh, these things must be operating, and that's why morphine works, because they bind to the same receptor that the opiates bind to. Okay. So they synapse in the substantia gelatinosa, and then those cell bodies that are rising from there, they send their axons across the spinal cord at that level. All right, so the crossing happens way the heck down in the spinal cord. It's going to be, see where they've tried to represent the synapses? It's right in the gray matter immediately when the axons come in. The axons are going to come in and synapse immediately. I'll show you a better, I'll show you a real live dead substantia gelatinosa in a minute. All right. All right, so then uh, that's the first synapse. These axons cross at that level, and then they do a 90-degree turn, and they will ascend. And some, sometimes this system is also called the anterolateral system. Did you get taught that ever? Okay, anterolateral, spinal thalamic, uh, all the same thing. It's called anterolateral because of where the axons travel in the spinal cord. It's anterior and lateral. Okay, so some of these axons go up, 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 and some are going to keep going, but some that are part of the spinoreticular pathway are going to stop and synapse here in the medulla, which is in what sub subdivision? Oh, that was kinemic. Come on. It's in the myelencephalon. All right. They're going to synapse in there in something called the lateral reticular formation. What's the reticular formation do? Say it loud. Nope. Try the other half. Wakes you up. All right. So the reticular formation sends axons all over the cortex, just sprays them all over the place. So anatomically, it's suited to activate, you know, just fire up the whole business, okay? It's, it's responsible for waking you up. So if there's a painful stimulus, say your rattlesnake is munching on your foot, you ought to wake up and do something about that, right? So it makes sense that you're going to have some axons that are going to the reticular formation, get that arousal going, get you moving, okay? Some of these other spinal reticular axons are going to also make another stop. Here in the midbrain. Midbrain is synonymous for what? Subdivision. Mesencephalon. And they're going to stop here in another pain gate. And this one is called the hairy aqueductal gray. We'll be seeing that in lab next week. Hairy aqueductal gray is another pain gate. So if you stimulate that and an animal is in pain, the animal will feel relief. Um, this one hasn't been used clinically very much. This one down in the spinal cord has. This one in the substantia gelatinosa. Uh, people who uh, are not responding well to pain medication, sometimes they'll stick electrodes in their substantia gelatinosa and give them a little cartridge to put on their belt, and they can push a button and stimulate that, and the pain will go down. So uh, that's been used clinically. To my knowledge, no one has ever tried this because it's too close to other things. Like if you screw up and you bang up the reticular formation, not good. What would happen then? You know, no arousal. Not only that, what will you be? You won't be dead. Comatose, right. Uh, not real good. Not a real good outcome, right? Okay. So on with the pathway. All right. So the spinal reticular goes to the reticular formation. Periaqueductal gray, and the rest of these axons keep going, 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 going. They're going to end up in the ventral posterior, posterolateral nucleus of the thalamus. All right? And then the story is just like the other system. It goes from the VPL up to the cortex postcentral gyrus. All right? All right. So uh, here, as promised, here's a real live dead substantia gelatinosa. So 
the very tips of these dorsal horns are the substantia gelatinosa. You can see the cell bodies up here are tiny and very compact, okay? So somebody with too much imagination decided it looked like jelly, all right? So substantia gelatinosa up there in these tips of these dorsal horns. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of double pain. So don't try this at home. All right, so let's talk about what happens when you encounter some kind of a noxious stimulus. All right, so we've got to go back a few slides. Here, this dorsal column system. All right, so let's say I stick my thumb here, wham, hit it with a hammer. What's going to happen? Which axons, dorsal column or the spinal thalamic, which system of axons is going to respond first and why? Dorsal column. How come? They're more myelinated, they're thicker. All right. So they get the message in. These guys are ripping in, and the other system, they're lagging behind. Okay? So if you subjectively think about what happens when you really slam your thumb with a hammer or something like that, get it caught in a car door, what happens is there's this real bright, intense flash of pain. Okay? Now, the cool thing about these neurons is they adapt out fast. They get the message in there, but then they poop out and they quit firing. All right? So when you slam your hand in the car door, you get that bright flash of pain, and then for a moment, there's nothing. All right? Just for a, a brief few sec, maybe a second. Then these poorly myelinated axons kick in. All right? They finally get their message in there. Bad news? These guys don't adapt. They keep firing and firing and firing as long as there's tissue damage. All right. So this is the, this is the kind of path, this is the pathway that will be active uh, when people are coming to a clinic. All right. And again, what I'm going to do here is I've already told you that uh, you have a map of your body on this postcentral gyrus, which is on which lobe? Parietal, okay. And so you can see it's disarticulated. So here's abdominal, pharynx, tongue, here's the lips, face, and then your hand, and then your wrist, and then your trunk and leg and stuff, just that. And what the artist is showing here, this is all in green, so it corresponds to this opposite side of the body. Why does it do that? Question is, why did the artist show that the uh, postcentral gyrus on one side of the body uh, corresponds to sensation on the opposite side of the body. Pathways crossed. Okay. All right. Any questions about somatosensory systems before I hit olfactory, at least briefly? Okay. We saw a lot of the olfactory system in lab this week. And so this is a close-up of a, an olfactory bulb so shown in sagittal sections. And this is why I couldn't show you the olfactory nerves. The olfactory nerve actually is composed of individual cells. They only show two here, but there's a whole series of these things that go along the nasal mucosa, and they just jump across your skull, which is here represented by this spongy stuff, and synapse there in the olfactory bulb. So we saw the olfactory bulb. We couldn't ever see the olfactory nerve. You can see here that uh, these mitral cells are the cells that give rise to at least some of the axons that leave the olfactory bulb, and they go out laterally, forming that lateral olfactory tract or stria that we saw in lab, right? And this is what it looks like on a human. Uh, what view of the brain is this? Ventral, which way is rostral? Up, okay. So here we can see the projections of the olfactory bulb, and what the artist is showing us here is that piriform cortex that we all saw. That was one of the last things we saw in lab. And it actually, in humans, looks exactly like in sheep, except in, in sheep it's laying out on 
the ventral surface, and in humans, it's kind of rolled in medially, okay? But it really is just exactly the same. It looks like this, and what the artist has done over here is to grab this cortex and yank it out laterally so we can see the terminations a little bit more exactly. So you can see these axons are going from the bulb and some are going to synapse here in what's called this primary olfactory cortex, part of the piriform lobe. They're going to synapse uh, in this, uh, on this uncus and also, as I'll talk next week, uh, inside that uncus is a structure you probably heard about called the amygdala. You ever hear that guy? All right, and also these axons are going to be projecting to this entorhinal cortex, which we also saw. Entorhinal cortex and part of this piriform cortex, all right? And I'll tell you some more stories about that next week. Going to give me one more slide? Come on, one more, just for the road, eh? Okay, all right. Something that we're going to see early on next week is we'll see some, another connection that goes from one olfactory bulb to the other. And that is something called the anterior commissure. Commissures are sets of axons that go across the midline. What's the biggest commissure in the brain? Corpus callosum. What's it connect? I'll trust that was correct. See you in lab.